Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 80 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. American prisons are overcrowded. The United States has the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the world. Nearly 2.5 million Americans are serving prison sentences, and approximately 20% of the American population has a criminal record. Nearly all politicians agree that we need to reform the prison system in the United States, but they disagree on what reforms to implement. Today, we attempt to gain historical perspective on this present-day problem by exploring American prisons and prisoners during the early Republic period. Jen Mannion, an assistant professor of history at Connecticut College and author of Liberty's Prisoners, Carceral Culture in Early America will help us investigate the early American prison system and whether a better understanding of it can help us find ways to reform the system in our present day. During our investigation, Jen reveals information about early American prisons and prisoners, crimes committed by early American men and women, and reform movements that sought to alter prison life during the early American Republic. But first, have you rated and reviewed Ben Franklin's World? It's been months since I've asked, and ratings and reviews in iTunes and other podcast directories really help the show find new listeners. Please help support the show with a rating and review. For more information on how you can help with this, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash review. Are you ready to take a tour of early American prisons and learn more about early American prisoners? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at Connecticut College. Her research explores early American history, the history of sexuality, and social justice movements. She has received national recognition for her work as the founding director of the LGBTQ Resource Center at Connecticut College. She is also the author of the book, Liberty's Prisoners, Carceral Culture in Early America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jen Mannion. Uh, Thanks for having me, Liz. The study of prisons is a timely topic. It seems like every time we turn on the news, there's a Democrat or Republican politician talking about our need for prison reform. But it also seems like such a dark topic. Jen, what drew you to study early American prisons? Well, generally, you know, I'm most interested in understanding the lives of ordinary people in history, especially people whose stories have not been told. So, you know, the history of punishment and prisons in America is a very important topic, and yet we still know very little about the lives of those who were imprisoned, who they were, where they were from, what they did, and how imprisonment really affected their lives. Would you tell us why early American men and women went to jail? What sorts of crimes did they commit? So early American prisons often contain numerous classes of prisoners. So those who were awaiting trial, who were charged often with interpersonal violence, such as assault, threatening, or battery, or also those people who could not afford to post bail. Then there were also vagrants, and vagrants would be held for 30 days without trial. And these were people who would be walking around the streets at night, possibly drinking, making noise, or soliciting money for sex. And then there were those who we think of as convicts, the people who were convicted of a crime and sentenced to prison. And the overwhelming majority of these people, both men and women, well, they committed petty theft. And so a higher percentage of women than men, however, were detained for these low-level violations of the social order, like drinking in public or making noise in the street. How did early Americans view and think about crime and punishment? Well, there was a very negative view of people who broke the law or people who were even suspected of having broken the law. And I think part of that is because life was hard for most people. And, you know, there was a sense that people should be treated harshly in prison. This was definitely a source of concern for a growing number of men who were involved in setting up the new system of government for the young nation. And they aspired to achieve higher ideals in punishment, you know, to be less violent and move away from violence and abuse and try to introduce more fair, humane approach to punishment. So some of these men, for instance, they formed a group called the Philadelphia Society to alleviate the miseries of public prisons. 
And this was simple, uh, trying to ensure that prisoners received enough food, clothing, blankets, and firewood to keep warm in the winter. And this effort it was later expanded with an eye towards transforming punishment entirely. If early Americans were concerned with lessening the violence of incarceration, what were prisons like when the United States were British colonies? You know, prisons were harsh places. Life inside jails was dirty and crowded and miserable. People might not have enough food to eat. Oftentimes the keeper would exploit inmates in order to make his own living. We have record uh, that the keeper might sell alcohol to people in prison who could afford it or turn the other way if a group of inmates roughed up a new prisoner or stole their clothes or their belongings so that then they could use those items to get food or alcohol from the keeper. Prisoners would scream out the windows and and try to get help or money from people walking by. It was a pretty terrible situation. You mentioned earlier that there was a reform group. Were Americans able to reform the harsh realities of the prison life you just laid out as members of an independent nation? I think so. You know, so the Protestant elites in Philadelphia, for example, were, you know, really influenced by the Enlightenment, especially the writings of Cesar Beccaria. You know, he argued the punishment should be proportional to crimes established on a scale and consistently applied. His ideas were taken to heart and the elites of Philadelphia, like Benjamin Rush and Bishop William White, I mean, they really tried to put this philosophy into action. I'd like to see if we can better understand early Americans who committed crimes. Do we know why early American men and women committed crimes? And do we have any demographic data that tells us who committed crimes, what types of crimes they committed, and why they turned to crime? Well, most people committed crimes of survival. So the theft of goods that they could either use in their daily lives, that they could trade for other goods that they needed, or even resell you know, for much needed cash. And this was true for both men and women. Theft made up anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the convictions against men and from 75 to 85 percent of the convictions against women. Now, women who were charged with theft were most commonly described as servants or former servants. And people were overwhelmingly poor. And this was disproportionately true of African-American women and Irish immigrants. And these two populations actually made up the overwhelming majority of women in America's first prisons. A fair number of Anglo-American men were also imprisoned. But once again, African-American men were dramatically overrepresented compared to their numbers in the population. Did men and women commit different crimes? Yes and no. Men and women committed remarkably similar crimes, and that was larceny. Men were more likely to be involved in higher stakes larceny cases than women. The men were more likely to be ringleaders of counterfeit schemes, for example. And, you know, when women were involved in some of these higher stakes crimes, they were often accomplices of men. Or, you know, at least that's how the state treated them. They were nearly always punished less severely than men in these sorts of cases. On the other hand, women were more likely to be charged with minor violations of the social order. So drinking in public, uh, walking around the streets at night, things like this that men did routinely without thinking twice. Women were often picked up and thrown in jail as vagrants for 30 days without trial for this kind of crime. Were there any women-led crime groups in early America? There is one famous woman, Ann Carson, who was involved in more of these high stakes crimes that were historically associated with men. And, you know, she had a long life of being involved with the criminal justice system in Pennsylvania, being accused of bigamy, being accused of killing her husband, trying to kidnap the governor in order to break her lover free from prison. And then, you know, it just kept going from there. Jim would like to know if early American courts and prisons treated child and female prisoners differently than adult male prisoners. Would you tell us about the experiences of women and children sentenced to prison in early America? First of all, early American courts did not want to face female defendants, especially if they were white and married. And so one of the reasons we see the court and prison system expand during this period is because of a larger breakdown in social hierarchies. So more enslaved and bound and indentured servants were challenging the authority of their masters and running away. More women were challenging the authority of their fathers and husbands and asserting independence or seeking divorces. So the courts really stepped in to address the behavior of this group. 
And even though women commit a much lower percentage of the serious crimes that were punishable by one year or more, they were extensively regulated in the streets by constables and watchmen. And they would just pick them up and throw them in jail for 30 days without trial under the vagrancy statutes with little recourse. Now, this was not happening to married women or middle class women. Unfortunately, the courts were also not very forgiving of youthful indiscretion. And so the large majority of women who were imprisoned for theft were under 30. And anywhere from 12 to 15% of them were actually under the age of 19. So you have a considerable number, actually, of girls in prison. Many of the women who were convicted of arson were also very young and given incredibly harsh sentences, anywhere from 5 to 12 years. And more than one of them died while in prison. We've talked a lot about both jail and prison. What was the difference between the two? Did jail mean that your sentence was less than a year and prison that your sentence was more than a year? How did early Americans define these two institutions? You're correct. It was jail was a holding tank, basically. It could be as small as a one-room building where people would be held if they were awaiting their own trial, if they could not afford to post bail. Prisons, we refer to when we're talking about the penitentiary. So these are places where you are sent after sentencing, after you've been convicted and sentenced to serve a certain amount of time in order to atone for your crime. How were jails and prisons guarded and governed? Tom would like to know whether professional police officers administered and governed early American prisons. So in the early republic, there was you know, no such thing as a professional police force. There was a loosely organized group of constables and night watchmen. They would have been barely trained and had a great amount of discretion in determining who to pick off the streets, how to charge them, whether to register a formal, potentially serious charge, or just to throw someone in jail for 30 days. You know, some middle and upper class residents would occasionally complain to the mayor about the watchmen. And in one instance in 1825, the Philadelphia mayor at that time, Joseph Watson, he actually suspended two watchmen after a resident from Fifth Street reported that he saw them drag and knock a man around until he was bleeding. There was similar conflict in terms of the governance of the jail itself. They were often poorly paid jobs for working class men who were, again, not very well respected and not very empowered, as they say. And so when reformers and other elites started to get interested in prison reform, well, there was a lot of conflict between the jailers and the reformers about the right course of action. And the reformers really had their way, in part arguing that it was the jailers themselves and their rough, violent tactics that were undermining punishment and what we wanted to achieve. And so they did, in the course of this movement, move to have the guards replaced with other keepers and guards who were more sympathetic to their aim of sentiment and reform and gentle, humane treatment in prisons. Let's investigate these reformers and reform movements. Were reformers trying to reform early American prisons because they still had vestiges of British crime and punishment built into the system? Or were they trying to reform problems that Americans introduced into their own carceral culture? I think at this time, it's still early enough. The Pennsylvania system that I'm primarily looking at has been modeled on the British system, British common law. The British penal code was implanted in Pennsylvania in 1718. And so we are definitely looking at the elites of Pennsylvania who want to disavow British practices, British traditions, what they think of as really barbarism, that British punishment was barbaric and was something that they wanted nothing to do with for the new democracy. And so the early American prison reformers aspired to cultivate sentiment and feeling and humanity in the prisoners, and that this was something that was not valued in any way in the British system. And so many of their changes were in direct reaction to the British system that they felt was barbaric and representative of everything that was wrong with old Europe and that would potentially hold them back if they did not distance themselves from. Who were these reformers? Would you give us an example or two that would help us learn more about the people trying to reform early American prisons? Prison reform was really important and it attracted some of the most influential men of the period. So Dr. Benjamin Rush, for example, 
Attorney General William Bradford, Bishop William White, Tench Cox, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, and lesser-known men as well. But we definitely owe to them the creation of the penitentiary system and this idea that this is where men would go to be removed from negative social influences and put on a strict diet and a daily regimen, and that in this process they would reflect quietly and engage in religious study, and that this process would help bring about the desired transformation that would help them not only become better men, but really true citizens for the young democracy. You mentioned that prisoners were expected to quietly reflect upon their transgressions. Would you tell us about Eastern State Penitentiary? Wasn't it designed with quiet reflection in mind? Absolutely. So, you know, Eastern State was officially opened in 1829, and it was built on the idea that solitary confinement was actually the most effective means, the most effective system that they could put in place really to force these men into solitary, quiet reflection. But the system didn't begin there. It actually originated in Walnut Street Penitentiary, Eastern State's precursor, although not very successfully because Walnut Street Prison was always overcrowded. And so the desire of isolating prisoners from each other was never successfully achieved. Earlier, you gave us several examples of men who participated in prison reform. Did women participate in prison reform, too? So the women get involved later. Uh, The women get involved in prison reform a little bit in the 1820s and then more fully in the 1830s. So, you know, one of the interesting stories here, I think, is, you know, why was that? You know, why when so many of their husbands and brothers and fathers were intimately involved in prison reform, why were the women not? And so one of the ways I understand that is because at that time, you know, prisons were just thought to be so degraded and not an appropriate place for a white middle class woman to be. Now, even though many of these female reformers at the time were involved in poverty efforts, that they were not involved in prison reform efforts. Unfortunately, I think one of the reasons why they were later permitted to get involved and embraced by their male counterparts was in part because the men had failed. And the prison reform effort from the first 30 or 40 years was not actually bringing about the desired change. And there was a pretty widespread recognition of that even in the late 1820s. And also a growing sense that they could no longer ignore women in prison, that women had been in prison as long as there were prisons, and that the women reformers finally convinced the men that they were in a better position to work with these women prisoners and help bring about their reform. In 1786, Pennsylvania attempted to reform prisoners by creating a system of moral reform through hard labor. Jen, would you tell us about the system of hard labor and why Pennsylvanians thought it would help prisoners? Well, the system of hard labor was actually short-lived, but it was inspired by an effort to get rid of corporal punishment and instead to use the bodies of prisoners for a larger public good. So rather than whip them or put them in the stocks or the pillory, that people would clean something or make something and that they would, in fact, help offset the cost of their keep. Now, this was a highly gendered system anchored in sexual difference because the men were sent out into the streets to clean the streets while the women stayed inside, sometimes cleaning inside the prisons, spinning and sewing. And so one of the prevailing theories of criminality at this time was that people were lazy and that they lacked the motivation or skills needed to work. So by putting labor at the heart of punishment, this particular issue could be addressed. Why was the system of hard labor so short-lived? Well, it was really a result of the prisoners themselves, and especially the men. Men who were out on the streets cleaning became known as wheelbarrow men. And this is because they would push wheelbarrows that would contain work supplies, but also a heavy weight that was attached to a chain that was attached to their neck. And so the wheelbarrow men were reputedly causing great chaos and havoc in the street, interacting with people, asking them for money, yelling at people. And this was seen as a real threat and really kind of working against the larger aim of what the reformers were hoping to achieve with hard labor. And so this public display of shame really ended up becoming a pivotal moment that led reformers 
to decide that they needed to keep prisoners behind closed doors, inside, behind the walls, away from the public so that they couldn't interact with them, they couldn't pollute them, and that the citizenry would not develop inappropriate sympathies for the convicts. And that's what they were afraid was happening when they were interacting with the prisoners laboring on the street. In Liberty's Prisoners, Jen discusses how some of the prisons contain factories. Jen, would you tell us about those factories and how they were used for reform? In Walnut Street Prison, once public hard labor was dispensed with and it was determined that everyone was going to work inside behind the walls, again, the women often continued their work spinning and sewing and tending to the domestic needs of the prison, cleaning the cells, making the clothes for all the inmates. Well, the goal for the men was to try to give them some skills, opportunities to develop new trades and also produce goods that could turn a profit that the prison could sell to help offset their keep. So two of the major manufactories inside the Philadelphia prison were shoemaking and nail heading. Now, this was not without its challenges because it turned out they had a hard time selling these goods on the open market for what they felt they were worth and that goods made by prisoners had a tarnished reputation and people felt that they should not have to pay as much for goods made by prisoners as they did for goods made outside of prisons. So the manufacturers struggled very greatly and very quickly the officials determined that this was not going to be a profitable system and instead they turned to sort of outsource the labor of the prisoners so that other businessmen could purchase the time of the prisoners and then provide their own goods for manufacturing that the prisoners would then work on during their time in prison, but that the prison system itself would not be responsible for putting out the money to secure the raw materials to make goods that they would not really be sure if they would ever be able to sell to recoup the cost. Did prisons find success in outsourcing inmate labor? Was this a program that continued throughout the early republic? Well, we have to look to New York for that story. And and when you do look at New York, the answer is mixed. As Pennsylvania moved towards solitary confinement and away from productive manufacturers, New York moved in the opposite direction. And their new prison system was designed around manufacturing. And there's a long and rocky history, really, of, you know, the penitentiary system in New York with manufacturing. And often, every few years, the contracts would be renegotiated. And in New York, there was a fair amount of controversy between local free artisans who were protesting the use of prisoners to produce the same goods that they themselves were producing that then would undermine the value of their goods. So it's a history of conflict as well. Would you tell us about the sex panics that plagued prisons during the early republic? What effects did these panics have on inmates and prison reformers? Regulating sex was a really important priority for reformers. It first came to their attention that inmates might be having sex with each other really in the 1780s when they first started visiting the prison and they recognized that everyone was free to move around the prison as they wished. And so therefore that men and women could be sharing rooms together and could be engaging in sexual intimacies. There was also some suggestion that women who engage in sex work for example, intentionally had themselves admitted to prison so that they could then work with prisoners as clients. So this was an outrage, and they felt like it was the very first reform that they addressed, that introducing sex segregation was the first organizing principle of the prison system. And they did that, and it seemed to have its desired effect for a number of decades It's really not until the 1820s that then another sex panic emerges. And this time it's about rumors uh, that men are engaging in sexual intimacies with each other. And so even though men and women have been isolated from each other, that's not stopping people from engaging in sexual intimacies with each other. Now, this had alarmed people for several other reasons. And and Pennsylvania officials actually had a somewhat surprising response, in my view. They downplayed it. It wasn't a real priority 
to them in the same way that it was to some of their New England counterparts. But I think they used it because at this time, they were desperate to secure the rest of the financing for the construction of Eastern State Penitentiary. They believed wholeheartedly that the only way this new penitentiary system would work was if complete and total solitary confinement was imposed. And so they used these accounts and reports of men having sex with each other to lobby for the funds to complete the construction of Eastern State. You mentioned that the primary concern of reformers was male inmates having sex with other male inmates. Did the reformers ever have concerns about female inmates having sex with other female inmates? Women's sexuality was not deemed as important as men's sexuality. And so the conversation around how women would negatively influence each other in prison was more coded. It was not explicitly about women having sex with each other. It was more written in this language of corruption and this idea that certain women and definitely women who had worked as prostitutes, for example, knew more about sexuality than other people and that they might have a corrupting influence on the other women who they were in prison with, or particularly the young girls. And so there is a veiled reference to it through this language of corruption and older, hardened, experienced women negatively influencing or corrupting younger women. And so that's how they described it, rather than explicit references to sex. So it was a concern, but not one reformers publicized. Correct. Today, the United States is faced with overcrowded prisons and a situation where statistics show that African-Americans and other non-white groups make up a disproportionate number of the people who are incarcerated for crimes. Jen, earlier you mentioned that in the early republic, African-American men and women were more likely to be incarcerated than white men and women. Would you tell us why that was? The problem of racism and punishment is actually as old as the penitentiary itself. And you can find even from the earliest years of the penitentiary in Philadelphia that African-American men and women are disproportionately represented among inmates. It's also true for Irish immigrants at this time. So in my study, Irish and African-American women are the majority of those who are charged and convicted with serious crimes. The numbers for men are a little different. So there were, even at this time, still a significant number of Anglo-American men who were committing crimes and convicted, along with Irish men and African-American men. On the women's side, however, you see, even as early as 1800, not just that African-American women are disproportionately represented to the numbers in the population, because there's a relatively small free black population in Pennsylvania at this time, but they begin to outnumber women of European descent, even as early as 1800. So that's a startling number. We've talked about race. We've talked about labor. We've talked about sex. Are there any other legacies of early American carceral culture that we can see in the United States prison system today? I think there are several important connections. I think, you know, racism and racial bias is the first one that cannot be overestimated how important it was. This is particularly true because the criminalization of African Americans happened at the moment of the founding of the penitentiary system and of the moment of the abolition of slavery in Pennsylvania. So when we think about all these things happening simultaneously, its implications are tremendous. Another thing that I think about having spent many years with these records and trying to make meaning of them is how ineffective reforms can often be. Even well-intentioned reforms and reformers are usually not leading to any dramatic change or dramatic solution or overwhelming reduction in the number of people incarcerated. And so I think as prison reform is such an important conversation in the present moment, we have to think very seriously about who these reforms are trying to benefit and are they really aiming to help those incarcerated or are they helping to make us feel better about ourselves or a little less guilty about this great injustice? Are there any reforms that early Americans tried or implemented that might help us as we try to reform our present-day prison system? Well, I think one of the earliest 
ideas that they had that we sort of take for granted now in thinking about it was the humane treatment of people while imprisoned. That just by being imprisoned did not mean you lost your humanity and that your time in prison could be a constructive, positive time. So even what we see in a lot of prison education programs right now, for example, I would think are rooted in the same philosophy that if you're going to pull people from their families, pull people from their communities, pull people from their jobs, at least let them get something from that experience. And so if early American reformers were thinking about religious conversion and moral transformation, you know, that one of the things that we're doing now, at least in some places, is giving people the opportunity to finish their GED, to take college level classes, to improve themselves and their chance of being able to secure a future for themselves when they get out. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the United States had stayed the course with the British system of prisons and punishment after the revolution? How would the history of American carceral culture be different? Well, the British penal system was incredibly harsh. People were executed for all sorts of crimes that we might consider relatively minor today. They also relied heavily on corporal punishment, such as whipping and branding. So if the U.S. maintained this system, the violence and brutality of the state would have remained visible to everyone. And I think this could have had both positive and negative consequences. It's impossible to qualify the negative impact of excessive, unrestrained violence and brutality on the American people by the state. Now, I think that would have inspired more collective resistance among working people and regular people if they were faced with this visible display of power and violence every day. And it might have prevented what we've experienced now, which is a widespread detachment from punishment by many people. But on the other hand, before the penitentiary system was established, there was no such thing as a prison term that would separate you from your family or force you to give up your job. And so it's possible to imagine the conditions for the prison industrial complex may have been prevented if we had never introduced this concept. What aspect of early American life are you researching and writing about now? Well, I've been working for a few years on a project about people who pushed the limits of sex and gender roles in the long 19th century, and really the popular perceptions of these people and how they changed from the revolutionary period when they were celebrated, and, you know, Deborah Sampson is a good example, to 100 years later when they were generally condemned and deemed mentally ill and sexually deviant. The working title for my project is Born in the Wrong Time, Transgender Archives and the History of Possibility. Where should we look for more information about you, your work, and how we can get in contact with you? Well, the best place to find me online is Twitter. I tweet at Activist History. And I also have a Tumblr page where I post lots of stories related to my research and also the present crisis of mass incarceration. And that is the same title as my book, Liberty's Prisoners. Jen Mannion, thank you for taking us through the early American system of prisons and punishment. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Liz. It was great talking to you. Just as in our own day, prisons in early America had problems. Inadequate support for inmates, problems with governance, and high rates of incarceration for non-white men and women. Reformers tried to address some of these problems. They tried to make the American system of crime and punishment more humane. But reformers missed their mark. They succeeded in creating prisons that hid prisoners from view, and sometimes their implementation of what they thought were humane treatments, such as offering solitary cells for quiet reflection, ended up being inhumane. It seems that crime and punishment have never been easy institutions for Americans to deal with, but this doesn't mean we should stop trying. Perhaps we can see something in our early American past that might help us create beneficial and lasting reforms today. You can find more information about Jen, her book, Liberty's Prisoners, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash zero eight zero. Are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook? 
This is a fun community full of history lovers and Ben Franklin's World listeners. In this community, we share ideas about life, history, and current events, and this is also the place where I field questions for our guest historians. To join, visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the homepage or text BFWorld233444. Finally, do you think that early American history holds any keys that might help us reform our present-day prison system? Send your ideas to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post them on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.